Every now and again, we come across information that not only has the potential to change history as we know it, but also the closed minds of certain individuals that have been spreading falsities for decades. When these individuals are confronted with evidence of a past civilization, they are going as far as to group together in an effort to smother the alternative researchers the world over. Guys, the tables are turning from what started out as a few individuals questioning the understanding of the ancient past is now gaining more traction than ever before as more and more people are actively pursuing these answers for themselves and in doing so, we are realizing that we have either been lied to on the most epic scale imaginable or our understanding of the past is only now beginning to develop. Whatever is going on, we seek truth and we aim to bring it to our subscribers wherever we find it. The Lost History Channel does reach into academia in an effort to seek out other researchers' thoughts into what was going on in the past and from doing this, we can bring you guys a wide range of histories that are unmatched by any other alternative history channel on YouTube. Sure, we have been tested through the years probably more than most, especially the past two years right up to the present day. But we are banging on the door of oppression and the fact that these almost daily battles exist overwhelmingly suggests that we are a real threat to these established institutions that will remain unnamed. Uncovering the truths is what we do and in this presentation we are going to present to you a layman's guide to something you may not have heard about before. Keith Hamilton recently published papers that uncovers something special. He has painstakingly pieced together something regarding the White Pyramid of Amenemhet II through research in 2011 by the Aceta Project and also sketches from previous researchers that are now museum pieces and we will be fully linking this below. Mr. Hamilton noticed that the basic layout of the pyramid complex of Amenemhet II which appears to encroach an area of Old Kingdom Mastabas. And this image that he acquired shows this. The highlighted area is the location of two undisturbed burials thought to be relatives of the king. The complex was only partially excavated by Jacques de Morgan in 1894-1895. And the few brief details we have of the complex were published in 1903 and we'll be bringing this to you. De Morgan's archaeological publication is unfortunately brief on the archaeological details of the complex that he did uncover, though thankfully he did provide some useful drawings. Miroslav Werner would later state, In 1895, Jacques de Morgan made an archaeological investigation of the White Pyramid ruins, but unfortunately it was hasty and therefore superficial. He was fascinated by the wonderful jewelry that was found in the princess's tombs and therefore he did not make a careful examination of the mortuary temple, the causeway or the valley temple. Olga from the, the project managed to enter into the pyramid substructure in 2011 and 2012 and managed to take some digital images of the inside of this unusual structure which we will be showing you later in the video. Amenemhet II is believed to be the third king of the 12th dynasty who reigned around 34 years. His chosen location for his complex was at Dashur which in this map of the Dashur region shows the location of Amenemhet's complex highlighted in red. This would appear to be the first pyramid built at Dashur since the 4th dynasty. The term white pyramid comes from the abundance of white limestone chips that litter the site. In this image provided by the ISDA project, we can just make out the top of the pent roofing beams sticking out of the desert and to the right, some large limestone blocks that are probably remnants of the pyramid's core framework. According to these reports, the pyramid's substructure is in relatively good condition, though poorly documented initially. The site of the White Pyramid has been previously noted by Carl Lipsius in the 19th century. The map he produced was crucial and is informative in that several features appear noticeable in his time such as outlines of the causeway and enclosed walls along with the construction at the eastern corners of the enclosure. Excavations on the site would commence on the 10th December 1894 
Morgan would sink a pit in the center of the main mound of debris. He soon came across carefully fitted blocks of white limestone, horizontally laid and arranged symmetrically. In this drawing by Morgan, we see the masonry walls, which he uncovered, and we can also see something similar in the framework of large masonry walls that protrude from the mud bricks at the Pyramid of Lahun. Morgan would describe that the base square of the pyramid was divided into eight angles and partly filled with masonry. However, towards the center, these triangles were devoid of masonry, but filled with sand instead. He went on and suggested that this was to distribute the weight away from the center of the pyramid where the burial chamber lay. The limestone blocks that he uncovered varied from 1 to 1.4 meters in length and 1.10 to 1.30 meters in width. He also states that they came from the quarries of Tura and that many of the blocks contained marks left by the stonemasons. Here we see some of the extraordinary hieroglyphic type mason marks found on the masonry blocks as sketched in the 19th century. No remnants, however, of casing blocks were found to give an indication of the pyramid's angle. Though the site has never been adequately cleared, some clues might yet exist that could help in determining the angle and size of the pyramid. Though in the grand scheme of things it is a relatively small pyramid, possibly only about 50 meters square from what we can gather from field notes. We see his sketch of the masonry core construction. The dotted line indicates the roof of the burial chamber. He says, It is impossible in the current state of the ruins to say what were the dimensions of the pyramid both in height and surface. It was entirely built of fine Tura limestone, and there remained during the excavation, only the debris of some of the lower courses. Nothing appears in his report that suggests the use of poorer quality limestone for the core, or even the use of mud brick in its construction. Granted, not much remains of the superstructure, but if such poorer materials were used in its construction, you would have thought they would have noted it. Pending a more detailed excavation of the site, we appear to have a superstructure built of fine limestone with a soft center of sand. The fine limestone blocks as shown here did not make contact with the substructure according to Morgan. After removing the last layer of blocks, my workmen encountered sands. Then, in the midst of these fluid materials, the roof of a perfectly built and fitted room. In his sectional drawings, we see the sand infill that separates the substructure from the superstructure in his notes. It reads, After the construction of the burial chamber, the ancient architects filled the entire cavity with fine sand to the level where they intended to place the first course of stones. The burial chamber roof consisted of six pairs of pent beams, and each pair were separated by a small distance, which was then filled with small stones and sealed with plaster. On discovery of the roofing beams, the archaeologist turned his attention to the north and soon discovered the descending passage, which gave him access to the burial chamber. Though he describes the passage as allowing him to examine the interior of the tomb in the smallest details, he has completely neglected to place these details in his publication, seriously suggesting his true intentions and indeed his description of the superstructure would hardly fill a page of text. We are therefore heavily reliant on his published drawings for information on the substructure However, as we will see, the photographic evidence provided by the Isida project highlights eras in Morgan's drawings. These have probably come about by his somewhat confusing field sketches and having to rely on his memory when it came to creating his published drawings, and we'll be delving into this archaeological field journal more in part two, as well as bringing you guys details of the findings of the Isida project back in 2012. We may not have the answers, guys, but we do have the questions, and we intend to ask these questions until the answers match the evidence. And we will, of course, bring part two next week. In the meantime, save our playlist and watch out for all the latest from the Lost History Channel. Comments below, guys, and as always, thank you for watching.